Hello friends and welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, September 29th and it is a dark, gloomy, rainy morning here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Cold, damp, all that good stuff and uh, I had a really slow start today so this video is coming out much later than usual. Uh, it's been a rough week. It's been a really rough week but uh, but I'm back at home, back in the shop and uh, I should say last week's been a rough week since this one has just begun but you know what I mean. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, I put up a few posts during the week. Uh, surprisingly, most of them were me sitting in bars <laughs> trying to hide from the world. Uh, got a really cool train post up, though, that went up on Wednesday, and hopefully you got to see that video. I really enjoyed making that. But, uh, yeah, I was I was in Pittsburgh for the week. My father-in-law passed away, as, as I think you all probably know. And uh, it was a rough week for, for my wife, for her family. Um, and throughout the whole week and leading up to it, you know, I got so many kind messages and uh, just people praying or just saying they're thinking about me or just saying they hope for the best and always mentioning my wife and her family. And, uh, you know, I passed a lot of that on. Uh, I got to the point where I don't want to call out any names or anything, but I got a, a, an email from a pipe club uh, out, outside of this state telling me that the whole club sent their condolences to the family and I passed that on. You know, it's it, it just really, really was wonderful. It, it helped uh, at times uh, lighten the mood, but also uh, throughout just let everyone know that there were so many people out there thinking of them. So thank you all for that, for helping us through a, through a difficult time. Uh, one other bit of sad news that's unrelated to that, but uh, I, I did mention it at least in the Friday live stream and I think one of the Sunday videos was our good friend uh, Peter, the Smooth Piper. Uh, his brother Daniel was very ill and we were praying for him and uh, sadly uh, Daniel passed away. Uh, he was called home to God and uh, Peter got in touch with me and him and his sister are you know working through that and you know, having obviously a difficult time because they lost someone they loved. So please keep uh, Peter, his sister, and, and his brother Daniel's soul in, in your prayers. Uh, in, in the coming week uh, or weeks because uh, we can never never have enough prayer so Peter I love you brother and uh, we're all thinking of you and, and, and praying and, and hoping for the best for you and your sister uh, so this morning I've got my favorite basket billiard which is usually the basket billiard I'm smoking and some eight o'clock coffee and we're just kind of easing back in. Where to put my tamper? It took me a while to get things set up this morning, and uh, I don't know if you noticed. I think I'm a little bit better. For a while there, it looked like the shelves were just sliding off to the side. It's it's the camera angle. I, I had it wrong. I think I fixed it at least temporarily. Although it might shift while we're talking. Uh, so one of my resolutions is to get a tripod, an actual real tripod rather than this jerry rig thing that, that I've been using and uh, maybe improve the tr production quality here a little bit. Maybe even clean up the mess behind me some. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk a bit about the week, about the funeral and, and some of those things, uh, in part because it was an unusual experience for me in, in several ways. Uh, but also in part because a lot of you have asked, uh, you know, for, for details about my father-in-law and stuff. And I'm not going to do a whole history and, you know, uh, a eulogy for, for Ray. Ray was a good man. He, uh, he impacted an awful lot of people, and that was very evident at the funeral. Uh, he was, as I mentioned before, a steel worker. He worked at the Homestead Mill uh, in the maintenance department and uh, worked hard, worked hard uh, most of his life carried the uh, the burdens of that uh, with him throughout his life in terms of injuries that he had incurred and uh, just the, the havoc that that can wreak on a body, uh, that kind of hard manual labor. He was also a veteran, uh, served in the Korean War and uh, served proudly, you know, remained active in veteran organizations right up until the time he passed, uh, was very quiet about that. I, I tried a couple times to get him to talk about the war and he really wouldn't. He, 
he he told me about uh, times where he he had to stand in water and it was cold and you know I never realized how cold the Korean War was. Uh, he, but some of the stories he told me, he, you know, people froze. It was, it was really terrible. Uh, but he had to stand in water for a long time, and he, until the end, thought that that was the reason he had so much trouble with his legs. He had poor circulation and things. Uh, but he didn't really talk about it. And I would imagine that he saw some stuff that a man would rather forget. But despite that, he was very proud to be a veteran, very active in veteran organizations, things like Project Healing Waters. He was a big fisherman and loved fishing and hunting and you know, always contributed to those causes, was involved in um, the Catholic War Veterans Organization, was actually the president of that organization for many years uh, up until his, his passing. Uh, just about a year before his passing, I think he stepped down, uh, the local chapter of that organization. Uh, he marched in parades for, for, for veterans. Uh, he was proud of that, that aspect of his life, and he had every reason to be. So the, the funeral was an interesting experience. I'm going to have to reload this because I spent a lot of time making that title card this morning, which far more time than I should have. Um, the funeral was interesting because my, the tradition I come from is, you know, if, you, if you're funeral mass, because I'm Catholic, if your funeral mass is going to be on Monday morning or Tuesday morning, let's say, just to make things simple, it's going to be on Tuesday morning. Uh, <clears throat> Monday night, there would be a viewing. That would be the only real event prior to the funeral mass. It would be for a few hours. It would be in a funeral home, and friends and family would come, pay their respects to the family, uh, go up to the to the casket where the where the body would be laid out. Maybe kneel down and say a prayer, or say say goodbye. Um, maybe stay around for a short while to to chat a little bit with the family, and then leave. And that's what a, what a uh, viewing is what we usually call it. Uh, others would call it a wake would be. Then Tuesday morning you would get up, you would go to church. There would be a funeral mass. Uh, move to the cemetery for the, the final interment, and there'd be some prayers at the graveside, and then that would be it. You know, usually you'd go out to lunch or something like that. Uh, sometimes there would be something at someone's home uh, where, you know, friends and relatives would gather and everybody brings food and there'd be something like that. But that was it. That, there, there really wouldn't be anything beyond that. The tradition, and maybe it's local to this community in Pittsburgh, or maybe it's a more Midwestern thing, I don't know, but... It was three days. There was um, <clears throat> a viewing. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the days mixed up here, but I think it was. That oh, can't be right. Saturday. No, it was Friday night. All day Saturday, and I think half the day Sunday was the funeral home viewing, and then mass was on Monday, and then a trip to the. To the cemetery, which was about a 40-minute ride, uh, which we did, you know, the family was in a limousine, and then a service at the military uh, cemetery, which was something to behold, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, I found it to be a really odd experience for me personally because, I mean, obviously, you know, loved the man. He was my father-in-law. He was very good to me. He is the man that introduced me to fly tying. He was the man that introduced me to freshwater fishing. Uh, prior to that, I was a saltwater fisherman, and I never even considered freshwater fishing. And that's all I do now. You know, he and uh, he was a friend. You know, he accepted me into his family. He, he was he was a father figure in, in a lot of ways. I think he would have scoffed at that, but but it's true. And he did this for a lot of people. A lot of a lot of the people at the funeral were neighborhood kids, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that were now coming together to tell stories about the first time they went fishing was with Ray, the first time they went hunting, and you know how he taught them to tie flies, how he taught them to cast a fly rod, things like that. And it was just really wonderful to see the impact that he had on so many people. Uh, he really he he had three girls. I think he probably wanted three boys, <laughs> uh, although he never said that. And he really spent a great deal of time with neighborhood kids, helping them out and, and, and getting them interested in, in outdoor life, uh, which was a wonderful thing. 
I'm going to put some more 100 books up in this as I talk. So, I was one of the pallbearers at the funeral. I was quite honored to, to do that. And it was an interesting group of, of guys because well, his two grandsons were there. He has two grandsons. And fine at the beginning. I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was sad, but I wasn't like feeling any strong emotions. But as this process went on, I started to feel it more and more. And I think I was taking on some of my wife's grief, uh, maybe just as a, in a psychological attempt to help her or something. But I found myself, you know, tearing up quite a few times, uh, especially during the funeral mass. So the pallbearers, in addition to myself and his two grandsons, were a collection of uh, these neighborhood friends, uh, one nephew that had a, again, a loving but somewhat antagonistic relationship with him. Uh, he wasn't the kind of guy that you would go up and hug and say, I love you. He was more the kind of guy that would say, what the F are you doing here? And, you know, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> it just wasn't that kind, it wasn't the kind of, relationship where you'd expect a lot of people to cry, but they'd be there to celebrate and remember. So we're all standing at the back of the, uh, the military um, ceremony that they have at the, at the cemetery, because there were limited chairs and there were a lot of elderly people. So we, we, we all stood along the back and uh, let the, the older folks and the women uh, have their seats and, and everything. And uh, this is an itch, honest. I'm not. So, if you've ever been to a military funeral, you probably know where this is going. First off, we drive in, and I put a picture on the on the cover uh, card for this video of, of a section of the cemetery. It's not my picture; it's one I found online. I didn't take any pictures. But it's like going to Arlington. This is the Allegheny National Cemetery. It's like going to Arlington. It's just, as far as the eye can see, these white tombstones just lined up, all identical, all very regimented lines, and they just go as far as the eye can see. And you're immediately struck by this sense of, look at all these men that, that died serving their country. And then we take a short break at this pavilion visitor center type thing because a lot of the old folks needed to use the facilities after a 40 minute drive. And then we go on to where the, the ceremony is going to be. Well, at this visitor center, there's a large stone carved uh, plaque of the Gettysburg Address. And I made the mistake of reading it. And, you know, I've read the Gettysburg Address in the past. Uh, most people know the opening lines to it. And, you know, very famous, not a very long speech, but a very, very impactful speech. And I think next Memorial Day, I'm probably going to do a special on the Gettysburg Address because it was, it was really touching and I think it fits well with, with that, uh, that day of memory. But it was touching, you know. It was hard to read. In that moment, it was very hard to read. So we get back in the limousine, we go to the, to the little place where they're having the ceremony. You walk in and there's the, the casket. Uh, there's a military casket draped in a flag. They come out, there's, the guards come out and stand on either side. There was a celebrant, I don't know what else to call them, a mil military dressed person that read a poem. And then they, I'm sure this is all um, a formula they use for everyone. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact details, but then they go into uh, the however many guns salute, and I didn't count. I don't. I don't know how many were shooting. I have no idea how many shots were fired, but it was, I believe, four rounds, for multiple guns. Uh, the first one is a little shocking, you know. And then they play taps as the the flag is taken off the casket and folded and presented to my mother-in-law. And even right now, I'm I'm tearing up a little bit just remembering this. But the, the amazing thing was, I'm standing back there with with all these guys that have been rock solid, non emotional throughout this whole thing. And some of them, you would not you wouldn't expect to be emotional at all, just because of the kind of relationship they had. Again, not a negative thing. Just just trying to point out the the oddity of the situation. Every single guy back there was sobbing. Not just tearing, but sobbing. 
it was one of the most incredibly emotional things I've ever experienced. And I'm, I'm emotional right now talking about it. I still don't know why. <laughs> I well, I guess I do. I guess I do. But it doesn't make intellectual or logical sense to me that this was so impactful. But, uh, yeah. It really drove home how important, uh, how important these men were, how important these men are, and what a great service they've, they've given us, and how important it is to remember that. Important to remember everyone, of course, but folks that serve the country so nobly, we can't forget them, and we cannot throw away what they died for. That's important. So, that was that story. Uh, I titled this video, Why Was This So Hard? And, you know, I could say the same thing about what I just did. I don't know, but it was hard. It was hard. I, I, I know at least uh, seven other guys that have that same story right now. At least. And I'm not even going to get into the people that were sitting down and the family members and all that. It was, it was tough. It was a tough day. But throughout there was also celebration of life and, and, and joy and sharing of stories and I'll tell you one story just to kind of give you a flavor of the kind of man that Ray was. And uh, I, I think it's a funny story. So Ray was the kind of guy, and I experienced this, he was the kind of guy that could talk to anybody, that would talk to anybody. Uh, it, we'd be out, we'd, we'd go to another state to go fishing, and we couldn't find the river <laughs> because we never planned anything. <laughs> And I would say that most of the times I went fishing with Ray, we did very, very little fishing and a lot more sitting around bars, BSing with locals, uh, which is what he loved to do. We did fish, but there was a lot more, I don't want to say drinking because we never really got, you know, stinking drunk or anything, but just hanging out and meeting people and chatting and things like that. And he was famous for this. He, he joined every club and organization you can imagine. So he was a member of the Elks, he was a member of the VFW, he was a member of all these little clubs that they have in Pittsburgh that are like private bars. Um, and one of the main reasons they have them is that it gives, well, it gives like-minded people a place to gather. A lot of them were built around ethnicity or uh, the type of work that you did, things like that. But also, because they were private clubs, they could stay open later. So it would be a place that guys could go to and stay till the wee hours of the morning and uh, drink or hang out with friends, that, that sort of thing. But he belonged to these everywhere. You know, and he traveled a lot. So he, he had family in Virginia. He had close friends in um, Myrtle Beach. He had uh, good friends in Georgia. He had family in Florida. And he would travel up and down the the Eastern Seaboard, just, just visiting people. And he would just one day say, let's go. And he, him and his wife would go off and just show up at people's houses and stay for a month, you know. And, and everybody loved it. Nobody ever said, oh, God, look who's here. So anyway, the, the story is that one of his, one of the boys that he kind of took under his wing and, and uh, became very good friends with moved uh, to, to another state. And I, I don't want to give too many details because I don't want to, I don't know who's going to watch this, but uh, he moved to another state and uh, lived there for many, many years. And uh, one day, this other person that's telling the story was visiting him. And there's a knock on the door, and there's Ray. And, uh, you know, they were surprised to see him, but happy to see him. And, you know, he's just, uh, just got a bug up me and decided to go for a trip. And, and there he was, and so they, they hang around for a little while, and uh, the guy who lives in this area says, why don't we go to this club? Um, let's, it, it wasn't the Elks, but let's just say it was the Elks. And, uh, you know, sure enough, 
Ray knew where it was, and he was a member there too. And and the the, the other the third guy was uh, probably had been there a few times, but so they they go to this place and they walk in and like four it's not very crowded it's you know the afternoon but there's probably about ten people and as soon as they walk in four or five of them say hey Ray how you doing and then you have to show ID and stuff and they stop the guy that's lived there for 14 years and say you know we need you he said you know I've been a member of this club for 14 years and you don't know who I am <laughs> and this guy that doesn't even live in the state walks in the door and five people get up to say hello to him uh, so he was a little upset about that but uh, yeah that's the kind of guy he was he made friends everywhere and it was evident in his uh, in his funeral because of the, the, the vast number of people that came and, and I, I, I heard so many people talking you know eaves, eavesdropping frankly uh, not a bad word not a bad word and so many great stories and so much so much love and respect for the man so it was it was really a, a wonderful experience and a wonderful celebration beyond that I spent a lot of time hiding because there was family stuff going on as there always will be you know these things bring out both the best and the worst in people it was nothing bad it was just stuff I'd rather not be a part of uh, so I had a hotel room and I had to work during the week. I had several meetings that I had to attend. So I took that as an opportunity to sneak away and then maybe go out for lunch or dinner. And uh, there were a couple of, I, I like eating at bars. I, I don't know why, uh, just something I've always enjoyed doing. So I, I like to just sit at the bar and sometimes you can chat with somebody, but it's not one of these things where you got to talk to somebody and there's always a, a game on the TV and stuff. So I, I did that a lot. And uh, yeah, just kind of hid, let them do their thing. Uh, but then did some stuff for my mother-in-law, repaired her washing machine. It's an interesting story in and of itself. Got a great old appliance store uh, story for you that I'll tell you another day regarding the washing machine. Remind me if I forget. And then uh, said our goodbyes on Friday morning and drove back, and uh, here I am. So, we're back in the swing. We will be doing a live stream this coming Friday, and we will be doing Stupid Joke Night. I got lots of stupid jokes uh, by email. If you want to add some jokes to the, to the fun, stupid jokes, dad jokes, whatever you want to call them, they're dumb jokes. Uh, I'll give you an example that I just heard from Google this morning. What do you call... A belt made of watches. A waste of time. Yeah, that's the kind of jokes we're looking for. We have a lot of fun with this. We try to do it once a year. So if you got anything you want to contribute, send it to me by email. It's canerodpiper at gmail. If uh, you want to join the live stream fun, it'll be Friday night at 8 p.m. And there'll be a, you know, a, it'll, it'll post early so you'll, you'll have a link to it. And uh, you can contribute jokes during the live stream. You can you can just type them up in the comments, or if you want to send me emails, you just let me know that it's there. I can I can check them. I do try to keep it as friendly, family friendly as possible. Although there will be a certain amount of uh, double entendre, if you will. Uh, won't be kid safe, but we try to keep it. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to, and I think we're back in normal mode now. My wife is home, which it's surprised me how long it's been you know I, I, I hadn't really been adding up the time that she's been gone but she's been gone a long time uh, so it's good to have her back she's gonna have to settle back into the swing of things we will see at any rate friends uh, I, I've uh, said what I wanted to say today uh, thank you again for all the support and love and kindness over the past uh, months, really, especially over the past week. My wife thanks you, her family thanks you, and uh, please keep Peter, the smooth piper, and his sister in your prayers, uh, and, and try to lift them up the way you've lifted, lifted us up. So with that, friends, I will call this to a close. I'll see you Friday night. Otherwise, I'll be back next Sunday with 
more fun. <laughs> so take care, my friends, and until we speak again, I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Bye now. Mm -hmm.